Thank you, Ali, for that kind introduction, as always. Can I add my welcome to you all? And it's so good to see so many friends on the screen this evening. Stroke, a preventable disease, is the fourth single leading cause of death in the UK and the single largest cause of complex disability. Strokes affects 85,000 people in England every year. Friends, that's 85,000 people every year. And getting into hospital and starting the right treatment quickly is key for making a good recovery. Although stroke mortality has halved in the recent years, without further action due to changing demographics, the number of people having a stroke, according to the NHS, is likely to increase by almost half. And the number of stroke survivors living with disability likely to increase by a third by 2035. So to help mitigate those statistics, the National Stroke Program has been developed jointly by NHS England and the Stroke Association, together with a wide range of clinical experts and people affected by stroke. The program supports local organizations to meet the ambitions for stroke set out in the NHS plan to deliver better prevention, treatment and care for the 85,000 people who have a stroke in England each year. I'm pleased that my friends, Juliet and Michelle from Stroke Association are with us this evening to tell us about their important work on stroke, prevention, treatment and recovery. We are also joined by our good friend, Dr. Mohammed Haider, right from Brent, who will also be providing some context from Brent. <clears throat> so first, let me welcome Juliet. She has been chief executive of the Stroke Association since June 2016. Prior to that, Juliet worked at Macmillan Cancer Support and oversaw a program of award-winning innovations and service design across the UK. She has also secured important government commitments to improving patient experience and post-treatment support through the 2015 Cancer Strategy for England. Juliet, I know you're incredibly busy, but thank you very much for joining us this evening. So if you can please have um, an overview about your work, please. And then I will shortly bring Michelle into the conversation. Thank you, Juliet. That's fantastic, Councillor Chef. Well, um, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me to join you this evening. It's really a pleasure. Um, and I thought your introduction was amazing because you've covered half of what I was going to talk about. So that's just brilliant. Um, and um, if that's all right with everyone, Michelle and I are going to do a double act. I'm just going to um, present the scale and challenge of stroke and a summary of the stroke. So in that it. case, uh, Juliet, let me just say, um, let me just introduce them, Michelle at this stage. Yeah, great. So friends, um, uh, let me just uh, interject uh, and, and um, uh, cut uh, in very briefly, um, uh, Juliet, uh, sorry. Um, let me just say, Michelle has held a number of senior roles at the Stroke Association and is currently uh, their uh, Associate Director for London. And prior to that, she was at Mencap and Show Trust. And uh, Michelle, very welcome this evening and really good to see you uh, on screen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Over to you, Juliet. Great. Uh, so next slide, please, Michelle, if you don't mind. Um, so um, Councillor Sheff has talked to a lot of these um, statistics. So, um, you know, very sadly, stroke is still the fourth um, biggest killer um, in the UK. And it's the single biggest cause of complex adult disability. A lot of people, when they think of people with stroke, think of the 
sort of physical um, challenges that a stroke um, can cause, um, but it also has all sorts of invisible effects, um, such as fatigue, cognition, um, memory loss, speech and communication challenges. And that's because stroke happens um, in the brain and the brain is the control center for who we are and what we do. So it really is a very disabling condition. And um, stroke does strike every five minutes. Um, and across the UK, there's more than 100,000 strokes um, each year. And because of the extent of the disability, um, it does um, cost the UK economy 26 billion pounds a year. The good news, as Councillor Chef has already said, is that the amazing advances in um, stroke medicine over the last 25, 30 years. And it does now mean that more people are surviving their strokes, um, but they're not necessarily living well. But we now have a really big population of 1.3 million stroke survivors in the UK. Um, and that compares to 2.5 million cancer survivors in the UK. So we're talking half the number of stroke survivors in the UK compared to cancer. But as we'll go on to say, stroke doesn't get anywhere near half the political and public um, funding and attention that it really deserves. So next slide, please, Michelle. So just a little bit about the Stroke Association. Um, we are a charity. Uh, we're funded, um, or two thirds of our income is funded through um, public donations and fundraising. We operate across the UK. So we operate in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. Uh, we have a turnover of about 40 million pounds, which makes us a sort of medium sized charity. And we directly employ about 700 staff and we have about 2000 volunteers um, who give their time uh, to us. Um, about 50% of our staff are frontline staff. So they're either stroke support coordinators who are going into stroke survivors' own homes when they're discharged from hospitals, supporting them with their recovery, or they work um, on our stroke helpline um, where we provide very specialist um, information and support to tens of thousands of stroke survivors each. So our vision is for there to be fewer strokes and for everyone affected by stroke to get the help that they need to live the very best life that they have. And we have two long-term goals, which are very easy to say um, and a lot harder to achieve. Um, so our first goal is to make stroke the priority it needs to be. As I said, it just doesn't get the public and political and NHS attention um, that it really needs and deserves. And then our second goal is to ensure that everyone affected by stroke has access to the rehabilitation and lifelong support that they need. And that's really in response um, to what stroke survivors tell us all the time, that actually their hospital experience, providing they get to hospital quickly enough, is generally very good. And they get quite intensive rehabilitation in hospital. But when they're discharged from hospital, it feels like they fall off a cliff. And so many stroke survivors report feeling completely abandoned by the system after that point. Now, the main way that the Stroke Association delivers impact is through um, delivering services, um, either information and support or um, what we call stroke recovery services, where we're supporting people in their own homes to set um, life goals and uh, to take small steps to improve their recovery. Um, we have recently um, made a strategic decision to invest more in system influencing, by which we mean we want to influence policy and system change. And that's why we're now partnering so very closely with the NHS in all four countries of the UK. I'm privileged enough to chair NHS England Stroke Delivery Board and we're now partnering with all 20 stroke networks across England to drive change. We do also have a small programme of research because we know that stroke research is underfunded and we're very much committed to community engagement because communities so often um, have the solutions for themselves and we're really committed um, to involving and engaging them as equal partners. And for the next three to five years, we've set ourselves four main priorities. Uh, the first is that thrombectomy, uh, which is a specialist treatment for stroke, which Michelle will talk about, is available 24-7 um, for all patients who could benefit. At the moment, the shocking inequalities and variations. 
So 80% of people who are eligible get a thrombectomy in London, but that compares to only 10% um, in the east of England. So really shocking inequalities. Um, the second is that we want to be there to reach and add value to the lives of every newly diagnosed stroke survivor. So we want to be there for everyone who's diagnosed with stroke for their first um, 12 months. Um, the third thing we want to do is increase um, public awareness and engagement with stroke. Everyone knows somebody who's had a stroke, and yet the profile of stroke as a major condition is remarkably low. And that therefore means that people are missing out on the vital support that the Stroke Association can provide. And then finally, we do want to drive income growth, because frankly, the more income we can raise, uh, the more people we can help. So that's just a little summary um, of the Stroke Association, um, our long term goals and how we work. So I'm now going to hand over to Michelle, because she's going to talk a little bit more about what a stroke is and what some of the essential things are to improve stroke outcomes. Thank you, Juliet. Although stroke is more common in older people, around one in four strokes happens to people under the age of 65. Babies, children, and young people can have strokes too, and there are over 400 childhood strokes a year in the UK. Alicia was 27 years old and working as a teacher when she had her stroke. Here she is, in her own words, sharing her experience. I know lion, giraffe, ele elephant, rhino, rhino, that's a tricky one. My mind when it's not coming to get that bubble inside, I'm stuck. I'm frustrated it's not because anyone's done it, it's just because I can't say it and it's not coming out. Bench. Oh no, it begins with S. What is that? Five letters. I think it was when I was at the rehab, they must have mentioned aphasia. Now what I know at this point, what aphasia means, you're intelligent, but you do have to start from the beginning. I didn't really understand this is a stroke. The doctors were coming and saying, you might not wake up, you might not be able to talk, you might have a wheelchair. It could be quite severe. I was a teacher for five years and that was honestly my passion, but it took a long, 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 like a year to accept that, no, I don't think I can be a teacher. I guess you can yeah. I smile, but I do have a lot of tears or upset or worry. I guess anxious, anxious. They don't really tell you that this is going to be an ongoing thing for the rest of her life and your life. But sometimes I feel that I'm in my own way. Like, own world, well, own world, well, while enough. everyone else is moving on. This is a scrapbook of all my memories. The reason why I kept it is because, like, look at this before how severe it is, but now it's, I guess, better. It's like to remember how much I'm trying to come. Exactly, yeah. I'm just trying to think about, like, when I have the sad things, what, what will I do to make it better? Football. Yeah, but the Americans might soccer. 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 Oh, football. They did call it football. <laughs> I don't think he knew how to do things in language. <laughs> I'm really happy with this new things I'm doing. Like I'm not. I've accepted that I'm not a teacher, but I am a teacher because I'm volunteering. I think everyone can do anything they want to do. Might take time, but I, I believe you can do it. Stand up and don't give up whatever you want to do. I feel so grateful that the Stroke Association has really helped us so much. You get to meet new people who have had a stroke, but now I am volunteering for the Stroke Association. And I honestly love it. You have to think that we are alive, but how can we help others now? We're lucky. We have to remember, imagine that point. I thought I was going to uh, die. They said that. But now I'm here today. 
I can walk, I can talk, I can learn, I can do so much. Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm quite grateful and blessed in that sense. A stroke is a brain attack. It happens when the blood supply to part of the brain is cut off, killing brain cells. The effects of a stroke depend on where it takes place in the brain and how big the damaged area is. There are different types of strokes. An ischemic stroke is caused by a blockage cutting off the blood supply to the brain. You may also hear it referred to as a brain clot. This is the most common type of stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke, also called a brain hemorrhage or brain bleed, is caused by a bleed in or around the brain. Hemorrhagic stroke is most common in people aged between 45 and 70. A transient ischemic attack, TIA or mini stroke, is the same as an ischemic stroke, but the symptoms last a short time. You get symptoms because a clot is blocking the blood supply in your brain. When the clot moves away, the stroke symptoms stop. Having a TIA is a warning that you are at risk of having a stroke. The risk is greatest in the first days and weeks after a TIA. So you urgently need to find out what caused it and get advice and treatment to help you stay healthy. If you suspect a stroke, even if symptoms passed, do the FAST test and always call 999. But what does FAST mean? Face. Has their face fallen on one side? Can they smile? Arms. Can they raise both arms and keep them there? Speech. Is their speech slurred? If you see any single one of these symptoms, it's time to call 999. The FAST test helps to spot the three most common symptoms of stroke, but there are other signs that you should always take seriously. These include Sudden weakness or numbness on one side of the body, including legs, hands, or feet. Difficulty finding words or speaking in clear sentences. Sudden blurred vision or loss of sight in one or both eyes. Sudden memory loss or confusion and dizziness or a sudden fall. A sudden severe headache. If you spot any of these signs of a stroke, don't wait. Call 999 straight away, even if the symptoms pass. All strokes are different. For some people, the effects may be relatively minor and may not last long, while others may be left with more serious long-term problems. A stroke can affect the way your brain understands, organizes, and stores information. This is also known as cognition. This can cause problems with memory, thinking, and concentration. Aphasia is a complex language and communication disorder resulting from da damage to the language centers of the brain. Around one third of stroke survivors have problems with speaking, reading, writing, telling the time, using technology, dealing with money, and understanding what other people say to them. It doesn't affect intelligence as people with aphasia still think in the same way, but are unable to communicate their thoughts easily. Almost half of people who have a stroke will have swallowing problems at first, but it often improves quickly. About two thirds of people have vision problems after a stroke. You could find it more difficult to do things like reading, shopping, or watching television. A stroke can cause problems with physical activities like walking and getting dressed due to muscle weakness, stiffness, and changes in sensation. A person might experience problems like fatigue, balance issues, and joint pain. Fortunately, most people make significant improvements in the months following their stroke. When someone close to you has a stroke, they usually need ongoing help and support after they return home from hospital. Carers tell us that they sometimes feel overwhelmed, exhausted, and isolated. It's important to know what the risk factors for stroke are and what you can do to reduce your risk. Risk factors can be anything about you and your lifestyle, like your age, a health problem, or whether you drink or smoke. As you get older, your arteries naturally become harder, making them more likely to become blocked. There are some health problems which can raise your risk of a stroke. Atrial fibrillation, or AF, is when your heartbeat is irregular and may be abnormally fast. 
This is a risk because the heart might not empty itself of blood at each beat and a clot can form in the blood left behind and cause a stroke. Most people don't get any symptoms, so it's important to get your blood pulse checked. If you have untreated atrial fibrillation, your risk of a stroke is up to five times higher and a stroke can be more severe if you have AF. High blood pressure puts a strain on all the blood vessels throughout your body, including the ones leading to the brain. This can cause them to become harder and more narrow, making a blockage more likely to occur. Diabetes and high cholesterol can also damage the blood vessels, which increases the chance of a blood clot developing. You can help to reduce your risk of a stroke by making some healthy lifestyle choices. It's never too late to make a change. Regularly drinking too much alcohol raises your risk of a stroke. Smoking doubles your risk of dying from a stroke, but the minute you quit, your risk of a stroke starts to drop right away. Maintaining a healthy weight and eating a healthy balanced diet can reduce your risk. Even making small changes to your eating habits can make a difference to your overall health. Being physically active can help to reduce your risk of a stroke. This can also help your emotional well being by releasing chemicals into your brain that make you feel better. If you already have a health condition linked to stroke or have had a stroke or TIA, sticking to your treatment can help you reduce your risk. Strokes can run in families, so speak to your GP or nurse if you have a family history of stroke. You may need some tests and health checks and advice on reducing your risk. Strokes happen more often in people who are Black or from South Asian families. If you're Black or South Asian, you may need to get checked at an earlier age for diabetes, especially if you have other risk factors. If you have concerns, you should always get individual advice about your own health and any treatment you may need from a medical professional, such as a GP or pharmacist. Some people with ischemic stroke are eligible for clot-busting drug that will return the blood supply to your brain. The process of giving this medicine is known as thrombolysis. For most people, thrombolysis needs to be given within four and a half hours of your stroke symptoms starting. In some circumstances, your doctor may decide that it could still be of benefit within six hours. However, the more time that passes, the less effective thrombolysis will be. This is why it's important to get to the hospital as quickly as possible when your symptoms start. After thrombolysis, 10% more patients survive and live independently. Thrombectomy is a treatment that physically removes a clot from the brain. It usually involves inserting a mesh device into an artery in your groin, moving it up to the brain and pulling the clot out. It only works with people where the blood clot is in a large artery. Like thrombolysis, it has to be carried out within six hours of a stroke starting. Only a small proportion of stroke cases are eligible for thrombectomy, but it can have a big impact on those people by reducing disability. The majority of people who could have had a thrombectomy miss out completely because of where they live or where they have their stroke. Meet Karen and Phil. It was so quick and so effective. It was, it was it's miraculous for me. I had lost, completely lost my entire left side. I'd lost sight, feet, mouth was like this, down here, just as you see on the fast adverts. Um, and the consultant said that she'd never referred anybody to a thought back to me, um, but a colleague had. And there was a peer to free, and there was. Um, the neurosurgeon from I just got full mobility, sight, speech, everything. I'm really quite disappointed when I was told that I was suitable for the treatment and that people weren't available at the weekend. I was quite angry, you know, that I'd have my hopes dashed, I guess, and knowing that was available. Yeah, I used a wheelchair for about two months from when I was discharged from hospital. It, it's quite a lonely a lonely thing, not being able to be as mobile as everybody else. Statistics tell me that actually I, 
and would have had a better outcome in terms of recovery had I had a thrombectomy. And, and, I, and when I got there, I was, they were in the, I was in a wheelchair and I said, stop. And the consultant was in the corridor surrounded by uh, surgery people and medical students. And I just sort of walked in, walked around, and felt like it was medical. Every day I feel, I don't want, I feel blessed every day. This isn't a service that needs trial. It, it, it's well proven, it's well researched and evidenced, even going back five or six years, it wasn't the event. It really should be available across the country 24 7. There is hope. Recovery is tough, but with the right treatment, specialist rehabilitation support, and a ton of courage and determination, the brain can adapt after stroke. Your brain is amazing. It has the ability to rewire itself, allowing you to improve skills such as walking, talking, and using your affected arm. This process is known as neuroplasticity. It begins after a stroke and it can continue for years. Every stroke is different. Not everyone can make a complete recovery, but many people make progress with their individual goals, like getting stronger, more mobile, or more independent. Around 5,000 stroke survivors live in Brent. There are also around 4,000 people diagnosed with AF and 53,000 diagnosed with high blood pressure. Managing these conditions well is key to reducing the risk for stroke. This is a typical example of how somebody who has a stroke in Brent is treated. After calling 999, the London Ambulance Service will bring somebody to the closest available hyperacute stroke unit, most likely at Northwick Park Hospital. They will receive specialist stroke treatment and care for up to 72 hours. This may include thrombolysis to break up the blood clot or thrombectomy to remove the blood clot. Depending on the severity of the stroke, people may return home or be transferred to an acute stroke unit to receive ongoing treatment and care. Where appropriate, some people can be discharged from hospital and continue to receive rehabilitation therapy at home. In some areas, there are life after stroke support services, such as the Stroke Association Stroke Recovery Service, this service provides information to better manage the impact of stroke, practical and emotional support to continue their recovery journey. There is currently no stroke recovery service in Brent, but stroke survivors are offered a review six months following their stroke by the local stroke team. There they can discuss how they are managing and identify if they still have unmet needs. The Stroke Association have different services and support available for everybody. We have seen thousands of people adapt to a new life after stroke. Anybody can access information and support through the Stroke Association's website and telephone helpline. We also have an online portal called My Stroke Guide, which is free to access that provides videos, information about recovering from stroke, and opportunities to connect with other people affected by stroke. We offer one-to-one -one telephone peer support for both stroke survivors and carers through our Here For You service. Stroke survivors and carers can join one of our community stroke groups, both online and face-to-face. -face. Details about stroke association groups and independent stroke groups in your area can be found on our website. We also have a childhood stroke support service that supports families and young stroke survivors. We're here to support people to rebuild their lives after stroke. Thank you for inviting us to join your meeting today. If you would like to leave feedback about the session and or make a donation to our charity, you can scan the QR code on the screen. You'll also find links to information about our services in case you or somebody you know needs our help. If you'd like more information about Stroke and the Stroke Association, you can visit our website or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. My goodness, uh, my goodness, uh, what a 
comprehensive uh, uh, overview of uh, what stroke is. Uh, I, for one, have learned a great deal. Thank you very much, Juliet, and uh, thank you very much to Michelle as well, and uh, some uh, lovely uh, overview indeed, and, and we'll try and explore some of those points uh, in a few moments. Let me now bring uh, my friend, our friend, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Haider. Uh, he's a senior GP uh, here in Brent and a Northwest London uh, Integrated Care Systems Borough Medical Director for Brent. And he's also Vice Chair of Brent's Health and Wellbeing Board. And I know he too has a very busy evening. He's got a clinic uh, this evening, but he has made a special effort to be with us this evening. And, and my huge appreciations to you, um, Dr. Hida, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, it will be really good if you could spend the next few minutes uh, telling us uh, what you um, and um, uh, the local team in Brent are doing. We've had um, a, a slide, um, particularly from Michelle, uh, around uh, Brent statistics. It'd be really good to hear about uh, what you and your team are doing, please. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Councillor Seth. I'm really grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this great uh, session today. Honestly, it is, it is amazing. As you said, I want to congratulate to Michelle and Juliet for their great presentations, making it so easy to understand the stroke and put it in a beautiful context. And I think uh, in my 26 years of medical profession, I always find it uh, challenging when you try to go and not use any technical words and, and, and present your, your knowledge as a storytelling knowledge, which is really powerful. Uh, a really amazing presentation. I would use this for our GP forums. And I think, Brent, we, we, we are a very unique borough. We know one of the largest boroughs in North East London. We have our challenges. It's one of the most deprived boroughs in North East London. North Circular acts as a river for, for us, and then our south of the borough have their own challenges and giving access to the services. I think uh, uh, lately, as Councillor kindly just introduced me, I am a local brand GP. I am also a brand resident. I used to live in St. Raphael's Estates back in 90s. So I used to take a bus to, to get to the hospitals and things before I, I established myself and now 33 years old or maybe 40 years old I am the borough medical director but I do understand what challenges we face is provision of the service in, in, in our Brent area. I think it was really really I was touched by the looking at the videos of that young teacher showing how it can affect one and then how positively with the support from the services one can look at rebuilding one's life after a stroke. And looking at Karen's and Phil's story in this presentation, I was really deeply thinking like, wow, I think it, it shows how stroke can affect the family members and how can one struggle to become self, self developing a caregiving role. Imagine my wife has a stroke and suddenly with my busy life, I suddenly become a caregiving person. Well, how do I balance this relationship and how do I support the stroke survivors and get closer to her. So keeping everything in mind as a borough medical director, as a person being in charge of our partnership, as you guys may know, we moved to integrated care partnership, which is the local authority, the social care and the health. They put their hands together and tried to work a service around the residents, putting the residents at the heart of everything. We need to deliver the service where we can uh, support them to improve the experience of and health outcomes for our patients and residents if they have a stroke in Brent. The main thing is that any individual who gets admitted to a hospital, honestly, they don't want to stay there too long. To reduce the length of stay throughout the patient's pathway there, you need planning, you need support, you need collaboration between different community systems as well as acute stroke units. So also we need to Stroke it's, itself has got its anxieties. When you have a stroke, when you go home, your family get worried about you. When you have a little bit of a headache or something, they want to send you back to the hospital. But we need to put some kind of support around people to avoid the admissions. And, and Brent, in comparing with our neighboring uh, borough, Harrow, just please keep this confidential, we have an excellent system of, uh, 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 it, it is called that early supported discharge service, which is really amazing. The service supports the patient just to be a help with transition from an acute sitting to a, a usual place of 
they want to go. Mm. So I think basically it helps to reduce the length of stay in one hand. On the other hand, it supports the patient to accommodate and get used to the life after a stroke. And that can only be done with the support of our MDT or multidisciplinary team, which is, consists of a hospital consultant, occupational therapist who are assessing the patient's mobility and ability to, to make cook for themselves, to dress themselves up, to be able to bath themselves, care for themselves, physiotherapists who can help them within their home setting to do little exercises to gain the strength back and, and overcome the weaknesses, speech therapists, as, as Michelle earlier mentioned, because communication is an essential part of it, and they try to train them to be able to communicate with the family and with the outer world. We, we can be impacted by stroke. It has got a lot of mental things on people, and that's the future. And we can get a psychologist. Sorry, there's a bit of a noise. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay, so so basically, I, I, I just better stop myself, otherwise I'll be going on. So Brent early discharge uh, uh, thing is is basically early supported discharge uh, service that we have is 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 getting referral from the stroke units uh, based at Northway Park Hospital, but we also have from neighboring hospital like Charing Cross or Royal Free, uh, and, and then these patients are referred, and then we try to support them with their homes. Brent is also lucky to have the Wilson Community Hospital where people who cannot be managed at home, supposing they're, they, they're in a very high risk flag, there's other issues, they can be also cared for in the Wilson Community Hospital. It can be referred by the primary care. I really, really like the uh, pathway analogy of the presentation, 999 ambulance, go to hyperacute stroke unit, from there they go to discharge home. That pathway from patient getting home and then once they're at home, what is happening to them? That is the part which is the hardest for the resident, the hardest for their relatives. And that is where we come together as a partnership, as, a, as an integrated care partnership with our local authority, with the social care, with the health, with the GPs and everybody, put our hands together to support the people. And we learned a lot from COVID. Brent has been a champion in taking the services to people. We always class our residents as hard to reach residents of population. But when I became a board director with my other co-chairs, I said, no, actually, look at it differently. We are hard to reach services. The patient doesn't know how to reach me, how to give the support. So what we did, we, me and Councillor Shit, we, we went to the mosque, to the churches, to the synagogues, take the vaccination to people. We went to people to offer the services similarly. So I think stroke would be not no exception. And I think we will work together to support our residents. And, and I think Brent Stroke Services is one of the good ones in Nova London. I hope that helps, Councilor Thank Shit. You. I hope it really was Thank you very much. I didn't prepare Thank any you. presentation, but I'd be more than happy to support you in the yeah. future talks. And, and then, then I'm open to any questions Thank if anybody has anything to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Muhammad. Really grateful to you. And you've just mentioned uh, in, uh, pandemic and vaccine and, and, and uh, hats off to you for all the amazing work you did during the pandemic in, in helping um, uh, roll out uh, vaccination right across the uh, borough. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. So um, uh, we, we, we will now uh, spend next 15 minutes or so that we have with some questions. We got lots of questions and surprisingly uh, lots of questions, so um, we've just got about 15 minutes, so I will ask our uh, guests to be as brief as possible so I can squeeze in as many questions as I possibly can within a very uh, short time that we have. Um, I say every single month that one hour does really go fast, and today it has gone even faster. So, um, Juliet, I want to pick up um, your, your uh, initial uh, uh, comments uh, and, and, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned um, uh, the high prevalence and in my opening words I said this is you know a, a preventable um, disease but with high prevalence uh, why do you think um, uh, this particular uh, disease has a very low public pro you know, profile which you were alluding to and, and, and why is it that um, we don't talk about it as often, we sh as often as we should? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great question. I have um, 
three theories that are completely unevidenced. They're my personal opinions, um, but there may be some um, validity in them. I think one is that when people think about stroke, they tend to think it happens to older people. And um, sadly, um, kind of conditions affecting older people don't grab sort of public and political attention in it's wrong, but that that's the reality. Um, the second um, is if, if, if you look at cancer, there's now a growing cohort of cancer survivors who are able to shout loud and proud about their cancer. And you have celebrities like Kylie Minogue, who's created a kind of whole movement of people sharing their stories and talking about recovery and survivorship. Sadly, for our stroke survivors and their carers, so many of them are just struggling with everyday living. They're just struggling with getting out of bed, toileting, getting dressed, eating. They haven't got the time and energy to share their stories. So we haven't got that kind of um, kind of patient voice that's as strong as, for example, um, in cancer or mental health. And then the third sort of um, reason, I think, is that stroke medicines are relatively um, new um, medical specialty. So 30 years ago, there were no available treatments for stroke. Um, there was nothing. Um, and in the last 25, 30 years, stroke medicine has come on in leaps and bounds. We have new evidence, new knowledge all the time. We've got, you know, game changing treatments um, like um, thrombectomy and thrombolysis. And I'm not sure that um, policymakers, including in the Department of Health and Social Care, have quite caught up with the evidence base because now we know that stroke is preventable, treatable and recoverable. We know what the risk factors are for a stroke and we know what can be done about them. We know that if people get to hospital quickly, um, stroke is um, treatable and the disabling effects can be reduced. And we also know because of what we know about the brain is that for an increasing number of people, um, they can um, make recoveries. And I think that sort of positive message hasn't quite infiltrated yet system decision makers and policy but makers. But, but, but we do have, so that positive message may have not filtered through, but we do have the national clinical guidelines yep. for stroke support for better outcomes. And I wonder, uh, you just mentioned about new evidence, the new policies. I wonder how that is uh, filtering down um, uh, on ground to be able to deliver uh, some of that narrative for better outcomes, for better uh, stroke care. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, we've just um, updated the National Clinical Guideline for Stroke. It was published at the beginning of April, and it reflects the latest research and evidence, including that for some people with salvageable brain tissue, thrombectomy can actually be delivered up to 24 hours from onset of stroke, not just from four to six hours. So it's very exciting. Um, and I think the main way of getting that message to filter down to influence commissioning decisions is um, through the 20 stroke networks that exist in England, because they're the key delivery vehicle and they're working really hard with the ICBs um, and with relevant providers and commissioners um, to make sure that people are um, really commissioning evidence based care. I think the reality, though, is that because of the chronic underfunding in the NHS, because of the workforce vacancies, it is a really challenging time in which to deliver um, improvements. I mean, Dr. Haydar, you're, you're, you're nodding. You know, our NHS colleagues are, are doing an amazing job in really challenging circumstances. But the workforce vacancies and the underfunding are beginning to take their toll. And if you look at um, stroke service performance, it's actually deteriorated, not just um, to levels below COVID, but it's actually kind of gone back six or seven years. So we've got quite a job to do um, to raise awareness of, of the new evidence. And, and I wonder, uh, Mohammed, if I can bring you in and, and, and um, uh, very briefly, if you can just say, um, uh, particularly around your awareness, what work uh, are you and your colleagues in Brent uh, and elsewhere in London are doing to raise the bar, to raise the game, please? 
I think uh, I must give credit to you because since our discussion, it was one of the other agenda because we we have a lot of challenges with mental health as, as uh, it's been mentioned. We got a lot of things with cancer, end of life. There's a lot of work stream with hypertension and diabetes. All credit to you, Cancer Shed, since yesterday, since the last time we had discussion, I said, actually, let me see what else we can do for our stroke side. And I had a chat with Dr. Raj Patula. And I said, Raj, we need to come and have a little presentation on GP Forum. And, and now looking at today's presentation, you, you're going to introduce me to better presenters as well. So it'd be a GP Forum thing to awareness among GPs and primary care team. But I think Brain Health Matters is quite a very well-formed team that we have. It's part of a health inequality, which we need to address this issue because that, that there is a, a, a quite a bit of inequality uh, around stroke care, as you mentioned, and absolutely right. We need to get to pre-COVID level very soon. So Thank I think you. my plan is just to work together with you. And I think as part of Thank the Brain Health Matters, we need to probably address some of these things. We have a lot of health champions. We got a lot of navigators and things. We have our social prescribing team and, and a lot of these things from the PCNs and, and, and the ICP. But some of these names are very new to people. I mean, if you ask a person what's a PCN, they may not know what is a primary care network? What do they do? So it's a cluster of all the practices we put together and form a network. So every patient get the same service from every practice is the same way. So that's we need to level up and try to reduce variation. In the past, if you had a good GP, you had a good service. If you had a GP which was slightly underperforming or probably had less staff, the patient would have not be looked after so much. With the primary care networks, we got the same thing. But coming back to your thing, I think we're going to have a little discussion after this, and I think we're going to involve our brain health managers to do a bit of work, definitely, and community colleagues from CLC. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, grateful to you all. Um, Juliet, Michelle, um, you mentioned a number of times uh, thrombectomies, and I wonder if I can ask you uh, a, a quick question on that. So the NHS uh, target to deliver a tenfold increase in number of patients receiving thrombectomies by 2022 was missed. And I wonder, uh, what impact this has had on patients and how do we get back on track, Liz? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the NHS long-term plan target was for 10% um, of the total number of newly diagnosed stroke patients to be eligible for thrombectomy. Um, at the end of last year, the actual um, percentage receiving thrombectomy was only 2.8%. Um, so, you know, they missed their target by um, a long way. Um, and as a consequence, last year, we launched a campaign called Saving Brains um, with five key recommendations for what needs to be done to improve access to thrombectomy. Um, this does include um, capital funding, um, it also includes um, faster training of the radiologists, interventional neuroradiologists who perform um, this specialist procedure. Um, but we also recommended improvements in the urgent and emergency care pathway, because actually um, up until the moment that the guideline changed, and actually it's still true, time is brain. It, it does rely on people acting quickly on the symptoms of a stroke, an ambulance coming, conveying them to the right hospital and then getting into um, the treatment pathway quickly. Um, and we are finding um, that that's not as optimal as it needs to be in all parts of the country. So we will continue to advocate um, to raise awareness and to promote the evidence and good practice where it exists. Michelle, I don't know whether there's anything that you wanted to add to that because London is actually the best uh, part of England. I mean, no one wants to have a stroke and no one wants to be eligible for thrombectomy. Um, but um, the part of the country which has the highest rates of thrombectomy is actually London. So Michelle, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything. Um, yes, London is uh, the best performing area and um, they're always striving to be better you can always improve so like currently also in London in two parts um they're doing a trial of a 
pre-hospital tracer, when they call 999 and the ambulance arrive, what they're doing is they're connecting them directly with stroke consultants so they can um, improve even more kind of and get uh, the, the decision as to whether they could get a thrombectomy or they would get thrombolysis or, you know, is it a TIA? Should we get them scanned? Is it better for them to stay home? And what that does is it gets people to the right place quicker than they usually would by having that direct access to a stroke consultant. But also it doesn't clog up the system. We know there are long hospital wait times. So if people are unnecessarily being brought to hospital and sitting in emergency rooms. So um, that trial, I think the ambition is for that to be rolled out across all of London to make that pathway even more robust and strong and, and better for stroke survivors to get treated quicker. Thank you. We've got about three minutes left and I've got about half a dozen questions. So I'm going to go, those, go through those questions very quickly. Uh, and, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, we'll come back, we'll you know, revisit this area perhaps in a few weeks time, few months time, and we'll have a part two if you like. Um, uh, so one hour is never going to be enough, as I've said a number of times, including this evening. But very quickly, um, Michelle, really I'm grateful to you for picking up some of those questions uh, in the chat. And, and one of the you know, questions in the chat is about um, what uh, you were saying uh, on one of your slides about uh, uh, the prevalence uh, amongst uh, Black and uh, Asian and other minority communities being pretty high. Uh, very quickly, and, and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, you, you could be very quick here. Uh, is there particular? Is there something particular that we can do to, to ensure that um, uh, we are uh, uh, responding to those communities uh, in a much more better way than we are? We, we, we already are. I think some of the key things will be like um, knowing whether people have high blood pressure, and for those that have high blood pressure, to to be treated and have it well managed. Um, the same thing for the atrial fibrillation. Like those are the two things that I think you know. Yes, the healthy lifestyle that you know all of that sort of thing, but really kind of keeping on top of the. AF good management and the high blood pressure will make a difference. You know, they've done some um, kind of different projects in other parts of London, in Southeast London, with two different GP practices where they noticed there was a 12% um, uh, well managed rate of high blood pressure in Black and minority ethnic communities compared to other communities. And they did some targeted work with their communities and they've brought it up in one year's time. They, they got the blood <coughs> their management rate to about 88, 89% in both populations. So they successfully were able to reduce that health inequality in that specific population. Great. And, and um, Juliet and maybe um, Michelle and, and um, maybe Haida, I wonder if you could just very quickly comment about the trials that were launched in Cornwall uh, in December 2022 about the new digital home test and how that could potentially prevent stroke make patients' life easier and indeed reduce pressure on GPs. What are the early feedback, I wonder? So I'm not, I just want to check what you're referring to. Is this the um, uh, blood pressure monitoring at home? Yeah, so these are the new yeah. digital home tests which have been rolled yeah. out in Cornwall, in Cornwall yeah. last December. And I wonder if you have any insight into what the early feedbacks uh, uh, are. So I don't have the data to hand. Um, but I do know that um, home blood pressure monitoring, providing the results are immediately uploaded to the GP practice. And then there's a conversation as soon as the blood pressure reading, you know, is out of kilter. I do know that that brings real benefits and it helps patients to feel in control. Um, I think the only challenge is that some patients um, struggle with the technology at the beginning, particularly stroke survivors. Um, who may have um, cognitive or speech and communication challenges, um, but certainly from other tests and pilots, home blood pressure monitoring um, brings benefit. Thank you. And, and, and um, this is, this is uh, you know, uh, the live, ex uh, live example, us on the Zoom. Uh, and, and I think the technology has really changed since the pandemic. And I wonder, um, uh, what, what all of you, um, what do you uh, see the uh, role of um, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, 
uh, playing in stroke care, uh, particularly since this has been launched um, uh, by the Department of Health and Social Care last December. So I'm really pleased to say that strokes are really early and fast adopter. So we've now got over 80% of hospitals in England who are using AI to augment consultant red brain imaging. And I can't remember what the statistic was pre-COVID, but it was very, very low. And then because of the necessities of COVID and because of the shortage of stroke consultants, um, NHS England um, developed um, a national contract with Brainomics and the evidence is unbelievably compelling. I think we're going to get to 100% of hospital trusts using AI to augment stroke right. consultant lead imaging by the end of this next um, financial year and um, the stroke consultants love it. Thank you very much. Well, with that a positive note, I'm going to pass you to um, Ali. Uh, and and uh, we have sadly run out of uh, time for questions, but, but uh, uh, do get in touch and, and we will hopefully have part two um, in not so distant future. But Ali, thank you. Thank you. And a huge thank you to um, all our speakers. That was so interesting. Such, such an important topic. And like um, Ketan said at the start, we all know somebody who has had a stroke. So, re you know, really relevant um, for all of us and fantastic presentations. And it's always so powerful where you when we get to see those those personal stories as well. So huge. Thank you. Thank you so much for this evening. Um, and just one last thing to say before we do say goodbye, which is that we will send out the uh, recording of this session and also send out details of um, the next lecture that we have. And um, hopefully we'll be able to revisit this topic again because um, there's so much more for us to for us to talk about. So um, thank you all for coming and um, ha have a lovely evening. Thank you very much.